Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as we're getting settled, I do want to take one more opportunity to thank everybody uh, for hosting uh, the students from Donlian uh, for two weeks. Uh, and I've already thanked hosts, students, uh, but in this case, I in particular want to thank all of the teachers who found out uh, not many days before they arrived, they were coming. And then, as is typical, went above and beyond in making sure those students, uh, when they entered as guests into their classrooms, uh, the teachers um, really uh, did a fabulous job of being uh, flexible and, uh, as I said, welcoming and even tailoring in many place, uh, cases their uh, classes for their visitors the actual lesson, so thank you, uh, and again, everybody else who helped with that. Uh, our Patterson Lecture Series speaker today comes from just 20 minutes down the highway, uh, Colby College, uh, is a 1994 graduate of Colby, and Ms. Carlene Burrell McRae uh, returned to Colby to serve as the Dean of the College and uh, now works collaboratively with the president, senior officers, and faculty to pr promote the vision of a fully integrated, <coughs> excuse me, a fully integrated student experience, combining the curricular and co-curricular dimensions of student life to bind together the student's intellectual and personal developments. Dean Burrell McRae, leads new and existing initiatives to foster a diverse and inclusive community. Before her current position, she was the Associate Dean of Students at Colby and Executive Director of the Center for Identity and Inclusion, which included the Office of Multicultural Student Affairs, 
the LGBTQ Student Life Office, and the Office of Student Support Services. She then, after Colby, earned a doctorate in higher education, a master's in social work, a master's of science and education from the University of Pennsylvania. She first heard about, discovered our special school here uh, just 20 minutes north when she and her daughter, I believe Coltrane was with you, um, two years ago saw uh, a Fossa Ballet Theater uh, presentation of the Nutcracker and through conversations with various people associated with MCI, grew to learn that this extraordinary program was housed here at this extraordinary school. Uh, and so very delighted that she accepted uh, the invitation to come to Maine Central Institute as a Patterson Lecture Series to talk on this year's theme uh, of uh, global citizenship. Welcome to MCI, Ms. Burrell McRae. Person and um, how many Mainers are in the room? Ra raise your hand. Come on. But I, I know that there's full blown, and then there, you know, folks were inherited. So what you should know is that I, I wondered if I was going to show up today after watching the game last night. But what I thought I would do instead is say congratulations to all, all of you folks who love football and had your New England Patriots. Um, you had a sixth win. That's pretty extraordinary. I will tell you that where I call home for to give you context for me to congratulate you is Philadelphia. So <laughs> it was really hard for me to watch that game last night. And I was like, come on, Rams, come on. But in the end, uh, you all really pulled through. And it, you know, I always say it shows a lot of about what it means to work hard and to be excellent. Um, to get to this point, so pretty incredible. So I know, who, so who stayed up late? Who stayed up really late watching? Who stayed up? All right, so I'm, okay. So I'm gonna try to make this uh, interesting and quick for you so that you are able to sort of move on and uh, enjoy the rest of your day and your week. I will say that I'm really honored and humbled to be here. And uh, I, I did experience the school in taking uh, my daughter Coltrane to be able to see the ballet, and I was both in awe and inspired by the young folks. So who, is anybody in the room that was in that ballet last year, or did everybody graduate? Okay, so you raise your hands really high if you were part of that. Thank you. It was really incredible to watch. I mean, you could just tell the dedication and the amount of work that was put into um, that piece to be able to share with the community and to be able to sit with my daughter and for her to see what is possible if you put your mind to something. Um, when you're dealing with a teenager, being able to see other younger people, um, to be able to show you that is much better than a mother trying to tell her daughter that she can do well. So I really appreciate the gifts that you shared with us. Um, I did have a terrific conversation with your headmaster, Chris Hopkins, when he was talking to me about this incredible school and who you all are. And what I will say to you is that in the conversation that we had, there was such pride um, and joy about how he talked about each of you and the contributions you've made. Students, staff, faculty, and the community of Pittsfield. So I really am grateful to have a few minutes to be able to share my story. 
Um, I don't know if you all, I know that it's about global citizenship, and when I was asked to think about a title, you know, what do you do with these things? And I thought, you know, we each have a story to tell um, about what it means to be in the world. And so my title was simply Global Citizenship. What is your story? Um, and so that's how I hope we engage today. So a special thank you for inviting me. Um, and I hope we sort of can all learn something about each other from this moment. So the theme of Global Citizenship. What I want to say to you is, I understand for myself about what global citizenship means. Um, but, not surprising, I decided to Google. We all have our phones, we live by them. Probably not a good thing some of the time, but I decided that I would Google to see what came up if you wanted to know who was a global citizen. Here's what one site shared with me. Global citizen is someone who identifies with being part of an emerging world community and whose actions contribute to building this community's values and practices. Another added, historically human beings have always formed communities based on shared identity. That seemed interesting, but I wanted to learn a little bit more. So I continued my research. Not sure it's real research when you're Googling, but that's okay. I wanted to see what else came up. So when I continued, I also, someone said, there are ways that you can become a better global citizen. And they began <coughs> listing what some of those ways included. Learning about the stuff that you buy. Look for the time, you know, but recognizing that even though you're looking at what you're buying, we're living in a capitalist world, so you might not be able to fully figure out where you're buying, where your stuff is coming from. But it also talked about traveling sustainably, making sure that you volunteer locally. They want you to donate, but they're encouraging you to donate smart. They also encourage you to read everything that you possibly can, and lastly, that you should try to get involved in politics. So that's some of what I found on Google about what it means to be a global citizen. It's not that I don't agree with what I read, but what was affirmed for me is that we are all capable of being or becoming global citizens. I appreciated that we all have our own experiences and stories that could lead us to become global citizens if we choose to do so. And I do believe that if we care about ourselves or families or communities and the larger world, it's imperative for us to do the work and live our lives as global citizens. A few years ago, I attended a farewell celebration for one of my colleagues who was leaving the University of Chicago. When his moment came to share his reflections um, with who gathered to celebrate him, he, he said something to us that his mother shared with him when he was really young. What she shared with her son was that he should remember to always paint his own canvas. Paint your own canvas, I repeated silently to myself. There was something about that saying that resonated with me. I thought, painting your own canvas gives you license the opportunity to develop into whomever you want to be. And for me, becoming a global citizen can and should be part of that canvas. In fact, I love that no two canvases will be the same, frankly, because the journeys we take, what motivates us um, in terms of what we embrace and how we embrace living the life that we want is different. And thus, we each have our own story to share. Two weeks ago, many of us celebrated the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who I believe defined um, what it means to be a global citizen. And although we will never be him, he sets an incredible example for what is possible. Who we are, what we represent, and what we're capable of doing should embody the gifted and quite radical 
I think people don't often think of Martin Luther King Jr. as radical, but he really was radical. And I think he was radical and loving, and in that way, he displayed what it meant to be a global citizen. So I'm not here to encourage people to make these very difficult and constant sacrifices like MLK. I think if we set the standard that high, many of us, including myself, would actually fail miserably at it. But what I do believe is that we could strive to be powerful vehicles of change in our own way. We have gifts to change our own lives and the lives of others. So for the next few minutes, I want us to think together about how each of us can and should play a role and even, dare I say, be radical to be global citizens that empower, change, and challenge. For me, being a global citizen is directly tied to issues of diversity, inclusion, equity, fairness, and social justice. I recognize we live in a society where people may be more open or perhaps a little less resistant to talk about issues of ability, religion, maybe socioeconomic status, sexuality, sexual orientation, gender identity, to name a few. Although in some neighborhoods and spaces, even those can tend to seem radical. People will sometimes feel some of those topics are less controversial or discomfort. I want to acknowledge that these issues are real and that many people are affected by our insensitivity, our bitterness, and bigotry. And in order to create a space of love where we support each other, we cannot forget that each person should be free to celebrate their identities and love in love and not fear. We cannot and should not engage in the whose pain is worse, because frankly, every painful experience leaves its own mark. So I wanted to acknowledge that our multiple identities and you all are really smart young people and the intersectionality of our identities are real. And we should not forget to sort of name those identities and share in those experiences with one another. But for this moment, I decided I wanted to talk to you about race. And I want to talk about race because many people think that we're in a post-racial society. And I want to talk about race because the way or America was created, we can always debate this later, it was created with a particular kind of violence which practically extinguished a group of people and used another group of people taken from their homelands to build this country. And it continues in many ways to show up in new manifestations. And I want to talk about race because many of us continue, including myself, to be impacted by what it means to be black in America. To commit to issues of social justice, equity and equality for all, we must be willing to talk about the elephant in the room. Often, it is about race. MLK gave a speech entitled, Where Do We Go From Here? Where Are We? The speech talks specifically about white people and their racial ignorance. In part of the speech, he says, in quote, whites, it must frankly be said, whites, it must frankly be said, are not putting in a similar mass effort to re-educate themselves out of their racial ignorance. It is an aspect of their sense of superiority that the white people of America believe they have so little to learn. The reality of substantial investment to assist Negroes, remember the time, assist Negroes into the 20th century, adjusting to Negro neighbors and genuine school integration is still a nightmare for all too many white Americans. White America would have liked to believe that in the past 10 years, 
a mechanism that somehow was has created has been created that needed only orderly and smooth tending for the painless accomplishment of change. Yet this is precisely what has not been achieved. He goes on to say, these are the deepest causes for contemporary abrasions between the races. Loose and easy language about equality, resonant resolutions about brotherhood fall pleasantly on the air, but for the Negro, there is a credibility gap he cannot overlook. He remembers that with each modest advance, the white population promptly raises the argument that the Negro has come far enough. Each step forward ascends an ever-present tendency to backlash. Now, I will say that was written quite a long time ago, and every time I read it, I, I'm thinking, we could argue that we're still in that space right now. So as I read this out aloud and in public, I have to admit to each of you, I feel just a little bit vulnerable. I find myself wondering, what exactly are you thinking at this very moment? I'm even slightly worried that you will leave this room thinking that I am that angry black woman full of hatred. That sometimes is a narrative um, that you hear and experience when you look like me. Angry, yes, but not hatred. So I want to talk about this hard issue together, or at least we're not in conversation, sadly. Um, but at least impart some thinking, because we have to acknowledge that racism is alive and well. I need us to talk about this issue because it is killing us, all of us, whether we know it or not. And I'd like to share a few personal stories to shed a little bit of light of who I am, so as I continue in sharing, you understand the perspective I'm coming from. So I was born in Jamaica in the West Indies, and we moved to, to this country when I was 10. The truth is I moved with my mother and one sibling that was just one year younger than me, because it took, I think my parents decided, not quite on a whim, um, but the educational system wasn't um, doing as well in Jamaica as they wanted to do. There was an opportunity to bring their family here, but it wasn't fully planned out, so my father, my younger sister and brother spent two years in Jamaica, separated from us until all the paperwork went through for the family to be together. It was not an easy thing to do, but my parents thought to be able to create the best opportunity for their four children, it was the right thing to do. It's obvious, standing in front of you, that I've spent more time in America than I did in Jamaica, right? But my parents, raised my siblings and I as Jamaicans in America. They did not want people to ever think, sadly at the time, that we were black Americans. For a time, they too believed so many of the negative stereotypes used to describe black Americans and wanted to distinguish and shield us from what people saw that it meant to be a black American. And they wanted us to be able to come into our own identity in spite of, of that negativity. So although I see and saw color, my orientation about race was quite different. My formative years in Jamaica were around people who looked like me. And so this idea of being a minority hadn't really taken to that part of my psyche. So for me, my husband is um, a Philadelphian. I love Philadelphia, right? I, I call Philadelphia home. And he was born and raised in this country and his ancestors a number of year, generations back were here. And you know, the, the, the conversations and sort of the cultural differences are real and what that means, although people look at us and they often don't think of that because for them, the visual is we are the same. 
But I think what it meant for me moving to the US and thinking about color and culture so differently than uh, black Americans were being raised to think of themselves as minorities, I would say um, it meant that I was a bit more open and trusting, right? Because although I saw color, it meant something very different to me. So my thoughts of how race, ignorance, and racism played out in life felt different to me. And so it was growing up and watching and listening that I began to understand what it meant and how um, insidious racism was in America and the impact that it had both in small ways and big ways on everyday lives, life of people. And so I know people often say, well, you know, slavery was 400 years ago, and what are we complaining about, and why can't we move on? And so I wanted to share just a few examples with you about how this played out in my life or my family's life. So my dad was an electrician in New York City, and he was in the British Army in England and was trained there, but when he came and he went back to Jamaica before we moved here, to the US and I grew up in New York City and he tried to become a part of the union, the electrical union, and it required him to go back and get some schooling. I'm also a first generation to college kid. And, but dad was really um, insistent on making that sacrifice because he wanted to ensure that his children would be well taken care of. But dad was, and dad went, finally took all the exams and got what they call, I think, a card, meant to a part of the union. He could not have met a more hardworking human being. But my dad would often come home and say, well, it was time for another furlough to happen, and the black electricians were furloughed first. It never, it happened every single time. There was not once where that was not the case. The black electricians were always furloughed first. Didn't matter what their circumstances at home were, didn't matter how hard they worked, they were always the first ones to be furloughed. There was another story I tell about my mother trying to figure out the educational system of the US. My sister and I that were older, I'm a product of public school. I love what the public school is capable of doing when they do it right. But my mother struggled of what that meant for my younger sister and brother, who are five and six years apart from the two older ones. And so my mother began thinking about um, the school that we were zoned, my younger sister and brother were zoned to go to, to attend, was not the best school based on where we're living. And so they began to research and help I wonder my mother was going to find a different, another way for my younger sister and brother to go to middle school. And she found this incredible institution that she thought might be willing to take them. But what she discovered when she called and began engaging with the school was that when they discovered that my siblings were black, they didn't necessarily want to invite them. But they thought they were black Americans. So they made all kinds of excuses about why there wouldn't be a space for my younger sister and brother, even though they weren't zoned there. And somehow my mother kept having conversations and they discovered that we were Jamaican. And in an instant, the conversation switched where the administration at that institution said, you know what? We know Jamaicans are hardworking people with good work ethic and believe deeply in education, so we will accept them. So here you have this dichotomy, right, of my mother wanted us to go to this school, my younger sister and brother. They were willing to take them, and we route the whole bus system to pick up my younger brother and sister. But it was because they were thought of we were as, as Jamaicans and not as black Americans. So here we were being given a privilege because of the negative perceptions of another group of people. That has an impact. That has an impact. And the few of us 
moments I wanted to share with you. So I, my husband, as I've shared, we had this thing when we were having children where I wanted a surprise. I thought it's, there are not that many, and, and this might resonate more with the, the parents in the room. You know, there are not that many surprises left in the world, and I did not want to know what we were having. Just wanted a healthy child. My husband, on the other hand, wanted to know. So we came up with a very convoluted thing, well, maybe I did, where it was when we could find out, the nurse would write it in an envelope, stick it in, a, you know, seal it, and we would hide it someplace, and if I made it to the last trimester, my husband could open it and look. But he couldn't tell me that he had opened it because I didn't want to sort of begin, you know, trying to figure out because I wanted to stick to this plan, and he couldn't tell anybody else. And he later tells the story where our firstborn is identifies as a girl. Our second child, the envelope said it was a boy. And my husband later tells the story where he says, I opened the envelope and in a moment I was so excited that I was gonna have a namesake. And in a split second after, I became overwhelmed that I was going to have to raise a black boy in America. Now think about that moment, right, where he is finding out that he is about, he's having another healthy child and he's having a boy. And he has to think about in an instant of what, so he's thinking about how am I going to share that when you get pulled over by the police? What do you do? You open the glove compartment, you put your hands up on the steering wheel, you make all of these things, right? You're in the elevator. What does it mean when people begin to clutch their purses, even though you're in a suit going to work, right? That it doesn't matter that you have a hoodie on. That's what he's thinking about. It has an impact. And just recently, my daughter came to visit me at Kobe. My kids have grown up on college campuses. And we have this new vehicle. And I don't have a fob yet. My husband, it's really my husband's car because I don't want to drive the truck. But so he has the fob. And but I needed to drive it. And my daughter needed to go out to get something out of the car. And I said, you gotta open it up. The alarm is going to go off, you know, you're going to have to stick the key in to get the alarm to stop blaring. So she goes down, and you can hear from my office, the alarm is going off, and it's not stopping. And so a wonderful friend decided to run down and help her. And she gets down, and my daughter is hovering in the truck. And my friend thinks she's hovering because she's a little embarrassed, right? Because it's loud, it's in the central parking lot. And she says, Coltree, baby, what's going on? She turns it on. And my daughter says to her, I was ducking because I was afraid people were thinking that I was stealing the car because of what I look like. This is my 14 year old. This is not a made up thing. This is our reality. Does it mean that we can't get through this? Sure it does. But there are scars that are created because of all of these experiences. What I do know is, if we're not careful, these experiences can move us to a place of hate. It can move us to a place that allow us, that, that motivates us to sort of look inward, right? And to be able to sort of just be around the people who look like us, who we think have the same ideology, uh, ideologies as us. And that is not a healthy place to be, I would assert. So I share these moments with you to connect back to my earlier comment about the issue of race and that it impacts all of us in many ways. These moments can add up and create distrust and can lead to a hatred without even recognizing what has happened. And not surprisingly, it happened to me. For the early examples, from these early examples, I knew I was hurt, out of sync with myself, 
and it was not allowing me to be the person that I wanted to be. It certainly wasn't going to allow me to live in the context of what it means to be a global citizen. Right? What I do know from the experience I've had and continue to have is that we all must engage in our own healing in order to be a global citizen. But it first starts with admitting what we're afraid of and that we must honor sort of what we know to be true and that we have to begin to educate ourselves. Most importantly, I think it's important for us to acknowledge the power and the privilege that we each have. And I'd argue that most of us that have this power and privilege, we don't earn. My own example of my younger sister and brother getting into that school, right? That was unearned privilege, right? Um, so I'm not suggesting that we don't have things that we've done where we've earned it. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm standing in front of you to say, I also have been granted successes or opportunities because of unearned privilege. Even when we believe we have worked hard and accomplished our goals with our family and friends, it's not just about that. A system is also helping us to be able to be where we are. There are many people past and present who have sacrificed, who have and continue to endure inequity and injustices for many of us to live more comfortable lives that provide us with a certain level of safety and security. I can't tell you what to do, but I am acknowledging my own unearned privilege, set of privileges, and I'm accepting that it comes at a cost to others. In turn, I'm sharing that these privileges come with great responsibility. It is not okay for me to walk away because I am uncomfortable. I must be willing to take risks, sit with and in places of discomfort, always pushing myself to lead with love. As Dr. King boldly said, power properly understood is the ability to achieve purpose. What is needed is a realization that power without love is reckless and abusive, and that love without power is sentimental and anemic. Power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice. Justice at its best is love correcting everything that stands against love. So, as you leave this auditorium today, I have a few questions for you. Could justice find its way as part of your purpose of being here? Could you commit to being just a little bit braver? Would you consider accepting the consequence to sometimes feel the loneliness of criticism because you stand up <coughs> and do something in the face of love and justice? Are you willing to gently and passionately call someone out when they have created harm, whether they intended to do so or not? And although we all lead busy lives, Will you commit to the continued education of yourself and this community? Will you accept the importance of becoming a global citizen and the notion that becoming a global citizen is not the foreign, exotic culture of afar, but right here in Castile, Maine? I encourage you to think about these questions, talk and listen to each other, and share together how you could be this kind of global citizen. In the, in the end, really what you're doing is painting your own canvas. 
You are inventing and reinventing yourselves. You are finding your way and helping others with theirs. Know that your presence, your experiences, ideologies, strengths, and areas for growth present an opportunity for some and tension for others. You need both. But all the while, your existence is holding space and inspiring many to do and be better. You all have the right to be here, challenging the status quo and fighting for equity and equality. That is what global citizenship looks like to me. And if we neglect this challenge, the consequences for each of us are really great. So here's what I'm leaving you with. Let's acknowledge the importance of becoming global citizens. Let us accept this journey will not be an easy one. Let us accept our privileges and figure out how to share or figure. Sharing is not hard to do. I think we learned that in kindergarten. Let us accept that we live with contradictions. Let us accept our ignorance and keep learning. Let us also accept that our ignorance can create hurt on any given day. Let us accept we haven't yet shown our best selves. But let us also accept if we walk in love, if we see, like really see and listen to each other, it can and will get better. I challenge us all today to continue to work at loving, even when our hearts and our minds are saying otherwise. So I leave you with this final quote from MLK where he says, cultivate an understanding that life is long, that people both change and remain the same, that every last one of us will need to mess up and be forgiven, and that we're all just walking and walking and walking and trying to find our way, that all roads lead eventually to the mountaintop. Thank you. successfully. Um, I hope students and adults who also have questions will uh, uh, raise your hands and ask them, but I felt I needed to ask one. Sure. Um, I don't remember what inspired me to say this to this group of students in the fall, but uh, I think something had me a little bit wound up and frustrated, and I said that this generation of young people, age, I'll say 13 to 19, hoping that I'm cap they're capturing all the ages, is that they get criticized for so many things, um, very often for being like this all the time, mm -hmm. while the adults say, get off your phone, get off your phone, are doing the same thing as you pointed out earlier. Um, and being self-centered, not looking outside of them, and so on. And yet, I said, I feel that this generation is actually more accepting of differences, um, accepting of what would even 15 or 20 years ago, or 35 years ago when I was in high school, individuals would be marginalized who are now accepted, and not just accepted, but often embraced and supported um, I'm wondering, and 
it's absolutely ok if you don't agree with any or all of what i just said i'm wondering whether what you feel about that statement whether you have a hope that this generation i'm i know i'm repeating myself but that is accepting in a way that i don't remember when i was in high school uh our being as accepting as they are so i'm an optimist so i actually do believe that i'm looking to you all to make it better right um i say to my current college students i'm looking for them to make it better so my own 12 and 14 year old will have a very different experience um i will say that i do think you do need to get off the phone um not surprising you're going to think i'm an old head that's okay um but the piece of the, the thing about technology that i am often um, concerned about is that you don't actually get to really experience people and you don't get to experience people um people are perfect on technology you don't see people's struggles you're not seeing and experience um, people's hurt people put up what is perfect and so when it, there's a moment to be able to talk about what is causing harm and how people can grow um, that's hard to do on technology it's also hard to do in a tweet uh, you know you have to be willing to engage in conversation you have to be willing i think to be able to be well read in thoughtful ways so that you can engage in a conversation and a debate perhaps sometimes where you have the appropriate information and how do you decide to agree to disagree and how do you decide to be able to say here i don't agree with you but it's it's we we can agree that it's not right to bully you know it's not right to be able to walk away and see someone being harmed whether we agree with the person's ideology or not and so to me i think that's the piece that you all have more access to learning about the world um what you do with that i think is going to be the critical moment for all of us thank you thank you very much We have a small token of our appreciation that we hope you will place on your desk down at Colby. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, lastly, one another. You said so many things that uh, I'm going to be pondering. Uh, hang on, everyone. But at one point, very early on, after some statements, you said, "I'm wondering what you all are thinking in your heads right now." Um, what I encourage everyone to do, and hopefully some of your teachers in class tomorrow uh, will pick up on this presentation, um, is to take what you've heard, to be critical thinkers, to be uh, intellectually curious, and have actual conversations with each other, with parents, with teachers, um, and take, it, take this opportunity before some of the work you just heard a to uh, explore them um, with, with again some uh, some care and some concentration um, didn't know the bell was going to ring that quickly i apologize if you would like to stay and uh, talk to our speaker please do so thank you very much once again faculty and staff